You're listening to Arsenal Pass, a flesh and blood podcast for players by players. And all about strategy, leveling up, and the latest news in the world of Wraith. Welcome to Arsenal Pass. Hi everyone, welcome back to episode 116 of Arsenal Pass. Hayden Dow here, joined by hotel room Brendan. Brendan, <laughs> just come back from a big snap event in beautiful Scotland and you got stuck in beautiful Washington DC on the way back. Yeah, it's actually more beautiful than than at least I thought at one point. Washington DC is actually not so bad, at, at least for like the one day the one day uh, tourist thing. Um, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> Hayden was uh, sorry. I, I, we we literally were rehat. We always record these intros after we do the main pod with a guest, and I we, we literally have this conversation. So I'm gonna have to edit it out of the main pod. But yeah, Hayden makes fun of me because I always get delayed. But a two day delay in Washington D.C. I mean, it's more like a one day, but overall it's a two day when you include like the nights and stuff like that. Um, not so bad, but obviously not ideal. Scotland. I was telling you, Hayden, before he hops on the pod, is ridiculously beautiful. Mm-hmm. So I was in Edinburgh. Um, I went down to Manchester for the tournament for the weekend. But before that, I went to the Scottish Highlands for, you know, saw a you know, day, 12 hours, 14 hours. Probably one of the most beautiful things and most beautiful places I've ever been to. It's absolutely incredible. Um, we went to this, we went to all these different little towns or like these glens, like these valleys into these burrows. <laughs> and I, I lifted, I, I'm, a, I'm a man of the glen now, Hayden. I don't know if you know, I lifted the, I lifted the 250 pound rock that you have to, uh, oh. you have to do to be, to become a man. Did uh, you really? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I lifted it. I lifted it a solid six something inches. And I was like, Oh, am I a man now? He's like, Oh no, it goes on the shoulder. I was like, okay, not happening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's not just, it's not just a deadlift, deadlift stance. You've actually got to, yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I have a quick question for you. Where, where's Manchester, Brennan? uh like what do you mean by like that where is it in relation to scotland or yeah what country is it in uh it is in britain <laughs> yeah okay just checking just checking. <laughs> yeah. i don't want to offend our uh, our uk audience when you was... are trying you know you put manchester in scotland i felt like it was a trick question i was a little bit i was definitely not confident but yeah it's uh it's like a hop and a skip down south and you're there which yeah. train Yep, train. Uh, which, dude, my tr- oh my god, <laughs> my train on the way back to Scotland was ridiculous. It was delayed by like seven hours because uh, somebody jumped in front of a train somewhere along the track, and it, it was hectic. We almost, we almost, we literally almost Ubered four hours or something like that. So um, you, you are susceptible to delays. I uh, guess I, I'm I guess, not traveling with you. That's my I, my new thing. Is I'm not traveling. I don't, with Brendan. Yeah, I don't know why I pushed back on that, but you're 100 percent right. I guess I do get a bit. I do get a bit um, unlucky. I do want to say though. Marvel Snap. So it's my first time playing Marvel Snap competitively. First time playing it at a LAN. Um, ultimately, I top eight it, by the way, and I lost in quarters. Really, really fun game to play competitively, especially at LAN. Um, being able to see your opponents and see the people. Very, very good experience overall. I, I was actually quite surprised. I didn't know if that game would actually scale well into a hyper competitive environment, but it did. So, um, yeah, super, super fun. Anyway. Yeah, it looked and- cool. It looked cool. I, yeah, yeah. I managed to catch a little, a, a brief moment of the coverage. I got to see um, Scott Howling Mines play one match on on coverage. It was at an awkward time for me being the UK, but um, yeah, no, awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, episode 116 of Arsenal Pass. We do have a great guest joining us on the pod. As Brendan alluded to earlier, we have Mr. Consistent, Mr. Battle Hardened himself, Brody Spurlock, joining us after winning back to back Battle Hardens over the last two weeks to talk about. Well, that keyword consistency. How do you be a consistent results getter in flesh and blood? And uh, we dive into some great stuff with Brody, plus all sorts of, you know, uh, <laughs> meat related questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> the lore behind the ham sandwich. Uh, yeah, the, we, we get the question it. everybody's been waiting for. Uh, so, obviously, your week in flesh and blood was uh, a bit of travel to Europe and uh, playing a snap event. You got to spend some time with the one and only Sasha, you know, mm-hmm. friend of the pod. Frolicking around the, the highlands with Sasha, there's actually a of I some saw. great pictures that Sasha will not let me post of me and him. Um, we weren't totally nude, but we were close. You know, we were taking a dip in some of these little these little lakes. Like it, it's so cool, by the way. I don't know Lots. if it's like this in Australia, but in the U.S., um, you can't really just like go off wherever you want. I mean, technically, like literally, yes, you can. Like you can go walk into the woods, but you you need like passes and stuff, and it, it can be a pain in the ass. In Scotland, yeah. they have this like free roam. Uh, law and yep. like we were literally doing that we were literally in the, farms and yeah 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 yeah, yeah. and there, there, so there's also there's no undergrowth in the highlands there's like there's no trees because they can't grow above a certain altitude but there's also no undergrowth it's just like all this kind of like spongy grass 
It's yeah. like that for miles. Like it's unbelievable. So you actually can't just go walk. It's um, we were it's, we were swimming and stuff. It was it was sweet. It's not so much like that in Australia because uh, I don't know if you want to walk into what uh, what animals live in the wilderness, but yeah. in New Zealand it definitely is. New Zealand you can do the same sort of thing, so very similar. Yeah. No um, predators in Scotland, by the way. I, I actually I clarified because I was with a, a resident yes. Australian and Sasha Markovic. I was like, is there any kind of like stuff that's going to kill us out here? He's like, nope, you're all good. So yeah. sweet. Yeah, yeah, you're not in the US or Australia or some parts of Asia. and, and <laughs> Honestly, most like, of the world is not like that, but uh, new, yeah. That's true. Find little havens. Uh, I've been mean, great, great experience. Back onto Flesh and Blood for my side. I did play some Flesh and Blood this week. I wasn't frolicking around uh, locks and, and, and things. Uh, I was drafting Monarch, actually. So, you know, Dust of Dawn releases in a couple of weeks. We've got the preview season about to hit us. Actually, after the pod drops, basically, we're into the preview weekend. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Uh, so, great time to get some Monarch drafts in before Dust of Dawn previews all start dropping and we start turning our attention to Classic Constructed, Nationals, you know, a couple of months away, less than eight weeks away at this point. Uh, did a bit of a draft camp on Sunday with some some locals here. You know, the, the tall Timmy was there, Brendan, you would love that. Uh, Nick Butcher was there. There was a few few different uh, Aussie players there, which was was great. We got, got a few drafts in. And um, yeah, man, I just, I was a little bit hesitant about returning to Monarch draft, but uh, it's so deep as a format, and I've uh, been enjoying it so far. And mm. I've also been losing quite a lot, so uh, mm. there's a lot to still learn Ooh, about relearning. monarch drafts. That's that's it's very interesting. I, I can't wait to hear. Like you know, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll probably do a pod on this. But you know, taking your original knowledge of monarch and then sort of relearning maybe the correct way to play the format now that we're in the modern, you know, modern flesh and blood. Hey, now I do have a question though. What do you think about your spoiler? Your spoiler is going to be being released after this podcast, which we do mention later in the main yes. topic. But what do you think? What do you think? What are the first thoughts? Most broken card ever printed or what? So let's let's give I'll give some hints on this because it's gonna okay. the, my, my spoiler drops I think two days after this. Uh, we can talk about it. we've got we've got two separate spoilers this time around. Me and Brendan yep. have separate spoilers. Uh, so look out for these on Twitter or maybe a YouTube short or something. We'll, we'll be dropping both of ours on July second though. Um, I was surprised when I opened up the card that Alice has given me this card. Uh, yeah. It is it is awesome. It is something that ties very tightly to other previews we've had before, I think, and also uh, tightly to you know my kind of history in flesh and blood. So I'm super excited to to show this card. It is very good. Like it's you know I know everyone's saying the card's very good. This card is very good, and uh, there's not many of these types of cards around. So yeah, no, I'm I'm hyped for my preview card uh, and and. On the flip side of that, your preview card, Brendan, is a very interesting card. I don't think I understand it, to be honest. <laughs> like, I, I legitimately don't think I understand it quite yet. I think it it does... Uh, if I had more context of the set, it would make a bit more sense. Yeah, I do believe it's a Vincent card uh, at that. Uh, it does seem to be a Vincent card. It doesn't say Vincent Specialization. It does not say that. But, um, you know, Hayden Hayden got a big a big old L. I got a, I got a common, so maybe I got to maybe got to tone back some of the things I've been saying about LSS. I don't know. No, it's not. But mine is legitimately hard to understand. I, I don't know. I've been thinking about it. I, I think I was right with my initial assessment, Hayden. But past that, it does look like a card that you definitely get more context for with the other cards in the set. I don't know if you had the same takeaway. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Also, this could, you know, as you like to say, it could break the fundamentals of the game. Your card. Not my card, but your card. <laughs> <laughs> uh, elsewhere, before we jump into the main topic with uh, Brody, just a few news items to cover off. Spoiler season, obviously, starts uh, as this pod drops, basically today, uh, or about 12 hours after the pod drops. Congratulations to... Well, we haven't recorded a pod in two weeks, so we've had two Battle Hardens. I want to say congratulations to Brody Spurlock and Brody Spurlock uh, for winning back-to-back -back Battle Hardens, plus Michael Fang and Dave Lynn, who joined Brody for the Teams event in Baltimore to take that out. Uh, there was some great coverage of that if you didn't check it out. Very cool format, I think. Um, you know, there's some, I think, some some things to iron out from LSS and what terms of a team format looks like, but I hope we see more team formats in the future. We've had callings. We've now had a Battle Hardened. Um, yeah, it'd be great to see some more of that. And then we had the final class constructed, a, a fond farewell to Ultim, where Lexi won the Battle Hardened in the hands of Brody Spurlock. Uh, so, yeah. Premier play announcements for the second half of the year. Uh, World Championships. About this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about the World Championships, Brendan? Uh, no idea. So, still no answer on the World Championships. I tweeted out this week. Yeah, I was getting a little bit frustrated, I think, and, and put out a little bit of a tweet, just, you know, venting that a little bit. Um, uh, you want to get your next spoiler downgraded to uh, a comment as well. Keep doing that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would love to get a comment. Uh, <laughs> so far, it's a plan out all right. 
calling Dallas, calling Taipei. Those are what was announced a few weeks ago, plus a slew of battle hardens. There's more coming to North America. There's Tokyo, there's Toulouse, Milwaukee, Warsaw, Kuala Lumpur, um, and St. Louis. Come on, man. Uh, oh, yeah, so no go Saint, and check out all this no battle hardens on the Alice's website. No St. Louis, no St. Louis. Yeah. Uh, FabTCG.com, check out where all of those battle hardens are happening. Uh, I'm planning to be, Brendan, this week, I've just sort of decided I'm planning to try and be at Taipei and Dallas. I'm fairly confident I'm going to be at both, which is very exciting. Uh, and, you know, maybe I won't be at Worlds at this point. Who knows? War of the Monarch, the Dust of Dawn pre-release, effectively, next weekend. It is Monarch Draft. Uh, go and check it out. I'm excited to play some of those. And you can, for most stores, I think you can get Dust of Dawn packs. It depends store by store. So make sure you check out what your stores are doing because they had to order the case in. Uh, but there is promos. There is the coal foil bin sets and uh, prisms. And then Skirmish Season 7, Brendan, is coming July 29th to August 13th. There is a Blitz pre-con skirmish for the first time. I know some stores are doing this to encourage players who maybe are new to the game to come and play their step up from Armory. There's also Draft and there's also Blitz constructed. So looking forward to skirmish season seven, which then leads into Nationals basically two weeks after. Mm -hmm. Do you see yourself playing a, a lot of skirmish this season? I will only play draft ones. It's so close okay. to Nationals. I'm going to be super focused on Nationals. I, I, have, a, I have a crown to regain, you know? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, yep. I mean, true, true, yeah, true. From from Mr. Nick Butcher, current reigning reigning national champion of that region. Yeah, um, and we just, I mean, we just have five uh, players from Australia top eight are calling, so it's going to be competitive at this nationals this year. So I'm looking forward to it. Uh, I guess that kind of does it. I think it's time that we grab one Brody Spurlock and and bring him into the fold, Brendan. Let's do it. And welcome to the main topic of the pod this week, Brody Spurlock. Brody, awesome to have you on the pod. Finally, we've had you on multiple videos with Brendan. Now I get to be on the pod with you. So uh, welcome to Arsenal Pass. Yeah, thanks for having me on, guys. I can't so it's the first time you guys are both on the same pod, by the way. I figured that you like I've done so many deck talks with Brody. I feel like you had to have been there, Hayden. I guess you were just there in spirit. Brody, I just want to off the back of your recent performance. Um, can you just go into a little bit of detail? on your history for the people that don't know it, at least in Flesh and Blood. I think that if, nowadays, when I, when I think about Flesh and Blood, I think about the up-and-coming talent. I think about the prodigy, Brody Spurlock. It seems almost synonymous with competitive fab at this point. But for anybody who's not aware, can you just recap sort of your past year and some of your accolades? Yeah, so I started playing the game in December of 2021, and I have basically poured all my time into it since then. I've gotten really obsessed, and I try to play as much as I can. Uh, the past year, um, I would say my top finishes kind of started with U.S. Nats last year. I made the top eight in September, and then I've been uh, really grinding the battle hard circuit since then. I've had some top eights and a couple wins, and I also made the top eight of Pro Tour uh, Baltimore recently. And yeah, I basically, I'm just trying to travel to as many events as I can, and uh, I've had quite a few uh, fortunate runs recently. Mm. I, I want to ask the first question, Brennan, the important one. So, Battle Harden. Uh, people are calling you now Mr. Battle Harden. How many Battle Harden top eights do you have, Brody, and how many wins? Because I honestly, I tried to have a quick look. I, I couldn't work it out, so you're going to have to tell us. So, I think I know the answer to this question. Um, after LA, I believe it is, is a total of nine top eights with three wins. Good conversion rate as well. It's better than better than uh, Brennan's battle hardened conversion rate. Well, it's better than yours too, you butthead. Um, yeah, I've never played pretty, a battle hardened. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty ridiculous to be honest. I feel like every time there's a battle hardened, um, I inevitably see your picture pop up on Twitter from mm -hmm. you know some SEG account about you winning a battle hardened. It's it, it's absolutely insane. Um, I just want to. It sort of begs the question though. How do you facilitate that sort of schedule and that sort of travel? Because these battle hounds are not all in the same area. I mean, you're traveling across the U.S. consistently, but also for things like callings, especially these days, you're con you're traveling out of country frequently. How do you, how do you sort of facilitate that lifestyle? And I want to dive a little bit deeper after the ask that question is how do you sustain the the plus EV tournament life? How do you sustain the professional flesh and blood lifestyle? Yeah, so I'm still in high school. Um, I do homeschool, which helps a lot with like having a more flexible schedule and being able to travel to these events and still do school. Um, I, as far as like making it sustainable, that has been my goal for a long time now. Is just to basically make it break even and 
if possible, try to make a bet on top of that. And these tournaments are not always plus EV to travel to, um, but they are like really top heavy. So in the ones where if I'm able to go all the way and win it, then it pays for that trip and like a couple more. Um, so it is not always high EV to go on the trip, but basically I, for me, it's worth it for the experience and getting to play as long as I can do well enough at enough of them that like overall it starts to break even, um, mm -hmm. which this year in 2023, I've been able to do that. So I feel really fortunate that I'm able to go all over and continue to meet new people and travel to play the game. Mm. This is actually this this kind of begs uh, a really important point. So if I if I look at professional flesh and blood and uh, performances across players, right? I would I would label you in the category of ultra successful, but you don't have something like a world's win or a pro tour win. You know these big huge payouts. So for people looking from the outside in at professional flesh and blood and the sort of compensation you can expect for consistently doing well at tournaments, which you do, ha is your run has it equalized around to about yeah, um, sort of net, uh, like net equal on EV. Like, are you are you about break even? So looking at only at like event expenses and like travel to get there, and then what I'm getting back from those events. Um, for 2022, I was not plus, but for mm. 2023, I have gone positive so far. Mm. Yeah, I think it's a really good perspective for people sort of looking at that tournament circuit life and wondering, you know, what level of success do I sort of need to be aspiring for in order to be able to do this? And, you know, a word that you use and a word that I like to use a lot, sustainably, right? Yeah, for sure. Brendan, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I've seen Brody twice this year. I've not seen Brendan at all this year, uh, just due to events that we've both been at. We were both in Singapore. We we're both at the Calling Auckland. And... Um, you know, this may or may not be true, Brendan, but uh, Brody may or may not have said to me that the, the the trick to breaking even, and Brendan Patrick should listen to this, is make sure you bring your own ham sandwiches with you. That's what I've heard is the trick. Oh my God, the ham sandwich thing. Can we dig into the ham sandwich? I feel like that's just a budding topic uh, at the front of everybody's mind. What What is up with that? Where did that come from? And is there any is there any truth behind this like ham sandwich only diet? So I do not live on a, a ham sandwich only diet, um, but it is true that that's basically the only thing I eat while at tournaments. It started just because, so basically I have a pretty simple food taste. Um, I don't like a lot of toppings. I don't really like any sauces or condiments. Most of the things I eat are very plain and dry. Um, and so <laughs> ham sandwiches are just something that I can easily find anywhere I go. I can just go to like a local grocery store, get a loaf of bread and a pack of ham and it'll last me the weekend. And I also just tend to eat a lot and get pretty hungry. Um, so throughout the day at a tournament, if I get like two or three hours in and I haven't eaten anything, uh, I feel like it starts to affect my ability to play well. And I can't think it's straight because I'm hungry. So I've started bringing these like big bags of water bottles and ham sandwiches. I usually bring like four or five sandwiches per day just to, you know, keep me fed and like i'm sa i'm happy with my sandwiches it's just like what i like to eat i don't need much uh excitement in my food in life um but i guess it's kind of become a running joke since i just always show up with the same bag of sandwiches and mm -hmm. i think like half the people uh are like amazed how i managed to keep eating them and not get sick of them i guess yeah um all right, we'll stop. We'll stop. We'll stop waffling around. Is some of the more fun questions. Can Can you dig into your performance here recently at the Battle Hard in LA and your thoughts on the on the meta right now? Yeah. So the the Outsiders meta has been one that has changed quite a few times in my eyes. Like what I thought was the best deck, what deck I was planning to bring to tournaments. The three main ones that I've gone through are Azalea, Lexi, and Olden, and so. Recently, at Calling Singapore, I was under the impression that Oldham was the best deck, and that was the deck I played. We saw several Oldhams in the top eight. Oldham won the tournament. And though Oldham performed the best at that event, there was a particular Lexi deck in the room that didn't end up making top eight, but it performed really well, and it was Alan Lau's uh, Three Remembrance Lexi deck. And I thought that he had a really clever strategy into Oldham, which was basically trying to just go super fat deck and fatigue the Oldhams. And after seeing that, I wanted to try it myself. And I played some test games with it. And that 
convinced me that maybe Lexi was actually the best deck if you had that plan into an unprepared Oldham. Um, so that's the deck I brought to Battleheart in Los Angeles. And I think it had probably the best matchup spread in the room. Um, and yeah, I guess I think Oldham and Lexi have proven themselves as the best two decks in this meta, but mm-hmm. I somehow am still not sure which one is better, which is pretty cool. Um, we're all the way at the end of the meta, and I would be curious to see, like, in two weeks, if this meta continued, where the Oldhams would be at it, like, countering the counter strat um, mm-hmm. with a three remembrance. Like this. <laughs> so you said, um, you said specifically said an unprepared Oldham. So if there was another tournament, you know, this upcoming weekend, would you bring the same Lexi deck with the same strategy? Or did you- it, like we don't even have to say it's this weekend, right? Just assuming that people would look at your past, your 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 result in Los Angeles, and adapt accordingly. Would you still bring that same strategy, or is it only into unprepared? To be honest, I'm not sure. I really haven't tested that far. Um, it was something I was even worried about, like playing the Sunday event in Los Angeles after um, playing a game on stream and a game that went to time that a, a big crowd saw on Saturday using that strategy, I wasn't sure if the Oldhams would adapt to it and then beat it. Um, I I played less Oldhams on Sunday, only like one or two, I think. Um, but I haven't really put time into the Oldham deck trying to beat that strat. Um, in Singapore, we were kind of conf- like, we were trying to figure it out on the fly. Like if we play against Alan, what are we going to do? Um, and I did play against Alan at the end of day one. And I just went the no- went with the normal plan of trying to fatigue him, and I failed, and he fatigued me. Um, so I would be really curious to test this farther if we did have more time in this meta. But since we don't, I honestly don't know what would happen or like which deck would come out on top. I mm-hmm. I can I can maybe answer this question for you yeah. <laughs> because uh, I was there in Singapore and we had the same discussion. So uh, Matt Rogers played against Alan Lau in round one and and got fatigued. And uh, so it was like, okay, how many? This deck was awesome, by the way. The, the the strategy that the Hong Kong players was Alan Lau plus multiple Hong Kong players that were on the strategy. So it wasn't just one person in the room as well. So it was pretty scary, I think, as an ultimate player at the event. Um, so we definitely discussed that, me, Nick, and, and Matt, um, what we would do in that matchup. And I was able to, after Singapore, actually play a couple of games. And that strategy is really, really good. I will say the, the one card that I think gives you the biggest advantage against that is... Um, is pummel <laughs> pummel to just like push damage because taking cards from them isn't necessarily the best thing but it is relevant and then you get to pummel over the top for for damage you can actually put them into a uh, a kill spot a lot faster so you end up yeah you end up basically just having to to kill them but it is it is doable but you have to know they're on the strategy i think which is like the hardest mm-hmm. thing um to your point brody it's funny i know alan said he was like uh making a joke he's like please don't put me on stream <laughs> please don't put me on stream on day one <laughs> that's how i felt yeah, when I was playing the battle hard and I didn't want to go on stream against any old ones because I was hoping I could like keep that strategy hush hush for as long as possible. How exactly does the strategy work? Is it literally blocking with every card or are you switching up to that game plan at some point? Um, like just how does it work? So basically you're just trying to like play out the best hand you can each turn. Um, you can still do a little bit of like setting up there, because basically there are still plenty of games where you just kill the old one through damage. Um, if you get fortunate Anthem draws, like, well, okay, I wasn't playing Art of War in LA, but, you know, if you get fortunate Rain Razor, Three Oak turns, um, you can definitely still just go over the top and kill them. Um, so there's still a bit of setup you can do, but I think you're, like, taking less off turns and just playing out your hand more. And basically, you're just trying to play essentially 77 cards uh, with the Three Remembrance and the Quiver of Abyssal Deaths. And you're just trusting that if you just attack them every turn with your full hand and they go through the normal blocking pattern of block three cards plus Rampart Crown, eventually they'll get down to, you know, sub five life with like three to four less cards in deck than you. And the fact that all of your cards come in for like between four and six damage and all of their cards only block for three will balance out with the fact that they can block two damage a turn without spending a card. And that in theory, the Lexi should just barely come out on top against an Oldham that's playing, I don't know, less than 68 cards. Mm-hmm. So Hayden, as you know, being a prepared Oldham going into the strategy, assuming you don't have problem in your deck, is there a specific way to respond or is it, is it directly related to that card? Um, exactly. Pummel. 
So I, I think, um, and this is why I still think in the hands of the best pilots, uh, personally, I still think Ultim is the best deck. They're the, all said and done at the end of this format. But I think if you go and watch the final from Singapore, um, uh, Pei Tang Lao had like a, a similar strategy. He was only on one Rembrandt, but had a similar strategy and also is a phenomenal player, like just maybe one of the best players in the world. I think if you go and watch that, the final and his semifinal against Matt, this the way he sort of navigated the match was 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 really well uh, really well done but i think you can see in that match like nick set up these points in the game where he knows he's going to pivot into damage to to force either cards out of um pei Tung's hand or get to a point where nick can just start to attack the game um using specific cards like command and conquer uh, even played one pummel in his deck it wasn't quite alan's strategy so he didn't play all three pummels but i i do think that is kind of how you have to adapt as the ultim is like you have to f basically you have to think much further ahead than you usually would i think the ultim lexi matchup traditionally has been this like okay the lexi is the player that has to think ahead they just you know they have to pitch the deck they have to understand what their rain raiser three oak turns are going to look like and it used to just be like i just block you know, the ultimate's just blocking and think about roughly having some threats at some point and, you know, make sure you keep your earth cards in your deck. And I think it's mm -hmm. a lot different in that matchup. You have to really think about where the pivot points for you are going to come, where you can actually trade up on damage efficiently and where you can attack because you have to reduce their life total either to kill them or to put them into spots where they have to block with their best hands in the deck when they do draw them. Mm. So I like if, the way that you explain that. Go ahead. Like now, like now that Lexi is the deck with more cards it kind of has switched it so that oldham has to finally be the one to spend the brain power and like he's the one who has to set up the pitch stack whereas lexi is just like here's my hand dump it on the table every turn i think that's a good way to describe it and i think that makes sense what the whole strategy you're talking about i i haven't played enough games to know whether it would work but that was my biggest fear is that oldham's would just decide to pivot and attack me at some point yeah mm. it's so interesting if 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 you guys had to cat like sort of cast your vote at on the best deck in the format now, what would you inevitably pick? I think Hayden yours is a bit more predictable, but you know Brody said he's been waffling, so I'll probably lock in Hayden, uh, old him for Hayden here. But Brody, you know with everything uh, with everything said and done, wh what do you think is or was the best deck in the format? I think that Lexi was the best deck in the room at Battleheart in LA given the circumstances of what everyone's deck list looked like and what everyone thought that their game plan was into each matchup. But I think that with infinite more time for everyone to adapt, I think I'm going to go with Hayden that Oldham would end up being the best deck. Mm. It's so it's such an interesting concept though. Like that is flesh and blood. The, like you Brody used the right, like the right words. I think the best deck in the room, like the best strategy in the room. And that is what it's going to be event to event, tournament to tournament is that, you know the the hero that dominates the format and say a road to national style open you know invite lots of different events versus one big event or you know one event on any given day is going to be can be different very interesting i want to i want to zoom out a bit um brody if if you could attribute your consistency of success to any one thing what do you think you would point to would it be a testing thing is it is it part of your process is it a mentality what do you attribute sort of this consistent success to i think that um an extreme amount of time helps a lot i put a lot of time into the game i practice every day um i also think that being in a top level testing environment and my team the wolf pack um helps a lot with being able to keep up with like we were just talking about the changing meta and how the best deck for a given tournament might depend a lot on what the perceived best strategies are from the previous week and i think being able to uh, be in an environment with a lot of other players who are keeping up with that and have creative new ways to counter it um contributes a lot to you know being able to show up and perform um i think if i have to point to one thing that really contributes to being able to perform um it's probably just the dedication and the amount of time spent to prepare um week in and week out mm. so at this point in flesh and blood what do you think is the biggest difference between a good player and a great player oh this is a good question i think Hmm. 
Hayden, did, did you have something you were about to say? I was just going to say, Brennan's giving you a lot of time to prepare for this question. You know, he really prepped you <laughs> for it. So <laughs> That's why they pay me the big bucks right there. What do you think, Brody? Do you think it's do you think it's related to a specific aspect of flesh and blood, pitch stacking, metagaming, or is it related to something you know maybe outside of the game itself, right? That the testing process, the people you surround yourself with, mentality, availability of time, etc. If you had to pick one thing, you don't have to be correct, right? You know, maybe we could revise it. You know, go back in a, in a few months we run this back again. But the first thing that comes to mind: the difference between a good player and a great player. I think that the biggest difference between a good player and a great player is really having a deep understanding of each deck's plan in a matchup. And like, it kind of goes back to the previous conversation of like this evolving metagame, depending on what the decks are and what the metagame is. Um, but like, understanding the things that need to happen for your opponent to win the game and for you and being able to immediately know whether both of you gaining three life is better for you or for them, for example. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be obviously in a fatigue matchup, then the fatigue deck wants you to both gain three life uh, naturally. But like there's, there are a lot of like situations where that might be a lot less clear. Um, so I think it's hard to, put it into very clear, succinct words, but I think mm. like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I could help you out. We, I think we would call it playing both sides of the table, right? Understanding what your opponent's deck needs to do to win out, you know, on top of doing, you know, understanding what your deck needs to win. Uh, we, I think we would boil it down to, if we were going to put it in a phrase, be playing both sides of the table. Well, I have to ask you, Brody, you know, how would a player how would a player go about acquiring that knowledge right because it is a bit it is a bit ephemeral is it is it a, is it a testing group thing is it the people you surround yourself with like i know there isn't an easy answer to this or a, or just a very succinct process but how would you recommend someone acquire that knowledge and level up into becoming a great player is it just is it just time with the game is it is it time practicing i do think it's really helpful to try to surround yourself with maybe masters of different heroes people who have put time into matchups that you don't have time to test right now. Um, it all kind of comes down to time, but if you can work with other people who are putting time into the things you're not, and then you share with them, um, like you gain infinitely more time by combining people. Um, and I think that also being willing to try new things. Um, one thing I've learned in flesh and blood is as much as it can be really helpful to like net deck a deck as a place to start, there, as much as this game has a somewhat limited card pool right now, there are a lot of underexplored strategies and underexplored cards and being wi willing to tinker with new ideas and maybe completely new plans for a matchup that you've never seen talked about before. Um, cause I, I've seen people do this and then just like stumble upon gold. Like obviously the greatest example is Hamilton with his wounded bull Icelander deck. Um, wounded bull had like hardly ever seen constructed play before that. And then it became a staple. Um, so yeah, I think surround yourself with people who are also putting time in and want to get better and don't be afraid to try new things. Mm. Would you, de would you define yourself as, as a specialist? Are you someone that hones in on a few heroes and tends to practice those, or do you try to get reps on everything? And do you feel like as you head into a tournament, are there heroes that you have a very strong proclivity towards, or are you sort of open to anything? Really what I'm really what I want to ask is in your testing group, are you the type of player that oper that sort of um, takes hold of a specific hero? Like maybe you're testing the Lexi more than others and you trust Hamilton to give you the information on the old him deck. Like how does that sort of, how does that land with you and the players that you surround yourself with? In a particular meta or, you know, in a month leading up to a tournament, I'll usually try to lock in on a hero and put all my time into that one hero and just provide games for other people playing that, uh, that one deck. But in general, I really value being able to jump around if necessary. And one of the main things I do in like off metas or like off seasons per se, is learn heroes I haven't tried yet. Uh, like last December, there were no big events going on, and I just spent the month playing Kano at Armories to learn him. Mm -hmm. Recently, during around the time of Road to National season, um, basically right after Pro Tour, I spent a couple weeks just playing Dromai at Armories to try to learn her because I basically I really like the feeling of uh, 
like having every hero in my back pocket. And I, I definitely don't have them all yet, but at some point I'd like to be able to have them all there to pull out if needed, because I think, you know, at some point in time, every hero is going to be the best deck in some meta. Mm. So I, I do. I have one more follow up question, then I promise I'm going to pass it back over. But in, in, in modern day flesh and blood with, with so many sets out and so many heroes being playable, I, I think in the past, it would have been an easy answer to say, yes, you should be, you should be able to play everything. You should have every hero in your toolbox. But as the sets have expanded, as the playable heroes, it becomes so many. I think we've seen more and more players hone in and specialize on a specific hero and have success, right? What do you think is the best? approach in the current day of flesh and blood do you think people should be spreading their time you know across you know many different heroes or honing in on maybe one to two and trying to become masters of those this is for people that are you know maybe good players trying to become great players aspiring to play on something like the pro tour or at the world championships uh, i think it's good to do either and i think it also comes down to how much time you have to spend um i think that if you just pick one deck that is in a position that it'll probably always be B tier or above. Um, and you just put all of your time into learning every matchup for that deck, all of the possible situations that might arise. And you're just truly a specialist. Like we've seen some of these players in the past have extreme success. I think that flesh and blood is a game that really rewards you for doing that. And I think that if you put, try to put equal time into all of the top decks, you can also get rewarded in these more shifting metas where, the decks all kind of have a counter and which one is best to play depends a lot on what most of the room thinks is best. Um, and like in situations like that, being able to switch around a lot rewards you. So I don't think there's a right answer. Um, I think for me personally, I lean more toward the latter of trying to have at least a fundamental understanding of each deck so I can hop around. But I think that it also can be really rewarding to be a specialist because one day your hero is going to be the best and you're going to be able to play it better than anyone else. Yeah. I, I want to jump on the back of a few things Brody said just for your questions, Brennan, because I think those are great questions. And that last kind of point, I think, points to fluidity of, of how you look at flesh and blood as a game. And, you know, Brody, you said something that really resonated with me, which was like, you will, you know, you jump around, you'll, you'll test, you'll learn these heroes when you have off time, when you are sort of, you know, maybe in testing, you might jump around a little bit, but then you try and lock into a hero X amount of time before the event and learn the game plans, know your game plans inside out. And I think I've got to massively kind of point to that as being one of the things that's helped me have more consistent success. I think in the more recently is I've done something similar i've tried to lock in early so i'd never really played Alton before outside of like a bit of gauntlet testing in in my testing sort of four events two and a half weeks before the event i thought it was the best deck i thought it was gonna be the best deck and then i learned it as quickly as possible learned all the matchups and just really focused on it and i think had i just continued to test a little bit here test a little bit here i wouldn't have been able to you know top out a calling for instance and i think it if you can nail down those game plans, it sets you up for success. Like I think if you want to beat the best players in the room, you have to have the right game plans for for the matchups you're going to encounter on, on the day. Um, so I think it's, you know, learn as much as you can, like you say, and especially I like how you're saying use your off times. I think that's the, the best time to do it as well. Learn new heroes. Uh, but at the end of the day, I think what we're 18, about to be 18 heroes in Class Constructed. That's that's a lot of uh, heroes to, to understand and then new ones being added all the time, right? Um, so it can make it difficult. The other thing I want to say is the the kind of what you pointed to, Brody, in terms of what makes separates good and great players. And you were trying to sum up words. And Brennan, you said playing both sides of the table. We talked about this, I think, like two or three weeks ago, Brendan, about this kind of facet of like consistency a bit. And I've thought about it more since then. And I think one of the things that make like the best of the best players so good is this idea of um, like the paradox mindset that you can think about a situation in any given way in two different you can hold opposing views to a situation like brody gave a great example about is the three life more important for me right now or is the three life more important for my opponent who does it benefit more if i play this you could enter a situation where it's like it's net it's net three life here you know i could block with this card or i could attack with it it's net three life but where is it going to play out the best and i think to be able to hold opposing views on that uh ex that specific example any specific example in a game of flesh and blood at any given time is what separates the best players from just good players i think it's it's such a hard skill to have and i'm not even sure that necessarily everyone can learn that skill but if you can if you can get it i think it's what can can get you to the next level mm -hmm. i'll also touch on adaptability 
Um, I think that this is something that Michael Hamilton showcased in some of his tournaments um, that can be really important. Like when you encounter a new strategy that you weren't prepared for um, in the middle of a tournament. And sometimes you'll run into situations where it's like you lose to it in Swiss and then you need to figure out what to do before you face it again in Top Cut, for example. Um, It serves you to like be able to, I, I guess, like... If you have people with you, it can help a lot to discuss with them and bounce ideas off each other in a very time sensitive situation. But you like asked what sets the good players apart from the great players. So I think that's another thing, like being able to adapt on the fly and figure out game plans for a situation you didn't prepare for. Mm. It, it's pretty interesting how how hard it is to develop heuristics for how to be good or how to be great at flesh and blood because the answer is always so dynamic and it comes down to sort of fundamentals and like you talk about adaptability being able to sort of read the situation dynamically and make the correct choice and the correct choice is not it's not clean cut all the time like the we see entire roles and matchups and switch right we have a deck like lexia previously seen as like an aggro deck the beatdown deck you know now become the fatigue deck it's it's just i un, i understand i empathize with the the difficulty of sort of defining that and articulating in a way because it, it does seem like the goalpost just kind of constantly moves and we see players that are able to sort of answer that question the correct way consistently have success but yeah, it's very hard to nail down to like this one specific thing it's like how do you become great how do you always make the correct decision it's like it depends a lot of it just comes down to time practice and just understanding of fundamentals of flesh and blood my mindset and this is going to make you upset brendan but i think heuristics aren't great in flesh and blood for the most part and i know that's going to make you upset but a lot of the time they can lead you down the wrong path devastating it's, it's devastating my whole world is shattering right now i mean heuristics are always a tool right heuristics, sure. heuristics are a tool to shortcut answers but heuristics without nuance will always lead you i think to failure um so it's important to you know be able to adapt past past your heuristics um, someone just scaled a but, drink during that time as well <laughs> yeah i know someone someone is deeply intoxicated right now uh brody just to let you in there's like a drinking game with certain words that are said on the podcast um Bro, I gotta ask you the hard questions. What the heck is going up with worlds? And what is what <laughs> you yeah, as a why don't we have worlds yet? <laughs> you as a competitive player, how much and a player that travels to all these events and frequently travels for flesh and blood, how is this uh, sort of delay in the announcement of worlds affecting you? Like, how does it in fact uh, also affect the the integrity of the pro tour, the integrity of competitive play? Like. It, it's, it's a really weird scenario, right? Like, we were told back at Pro Tour Baltimore, I'm sure you were standing in front of the same panel I was, when they were, it looked like they were about to announce the, the venue, and James said, TBD, but it's happening very, very soon. We haven't heard anything. Do, is there any concern in your mind that this maybe gets postponed, delayed, even canceled for the year? Yeah, I mean, I would certainly hope it wouldn't get canceled, but I definitely have been curious, like everyone else, and a little bit concerned um it definitely seems like they've got some sort of they ran into an issue um just like an unexpected cancellation from the venue or you know something happened where they couldn't do it in a particular country even um i'm going to do everything in my power to go no matter what but i definitely have been concerned in the last couple weeks about um the amount of time it's taking just because i don't want to see other players unable to go because they didn't have enough time to plan their trip um i'm sure that it is like just an unfortunate, unforeseen situation at LSS where the details were changed like in a way that they didn't expect. Um, but I really hope they're able to figure it out soon and you know get the announcement out so that people can book trips and we can all make it to Europe. Uh, or you know, some people are already in Europe. <laughs> yeah, we're to travel. Yeah, honestly, at this point, if it is in Europe, I mean, it, it could be anywhere. Uh, off the back of that, Brody, do you prefer one pro tour or two per year? Personally, I strongly prefer two pro tours just because I really love events. I love competing. And the more big events there are to prepare for, the more fun my year is. So I prefer when there are two pro tours. Hayden, someone with limited time over there. And, you know, I think you've been you've praised the one pro tour model a little bit. Are you still in that that sort of. Uh, that camp uh, at the moment are you still sort of in you you would prefer one pro tour over the two or you know maybe after experiencing it you like would you want to go back to two 
I've never preferred one over two. I think two is my preference. I just think that mm. this year, in particular, with the way that LSS was set up and they're trying to grow markets, that one Pro Tour probably worked better, I think, um, and was like a reasonable decision. I think, you know, growing the calling scene, growing the battle hardened scene is a good place to invest time and, and money. So, you know, in the future, I would I would hope we go back to two, if not, you know, three Pro Tours mm. plus Worlds. Like, you know, I, I think that's an, important for the game. But the, the calling scene is something that's so it just has something unique to it. I don't know if you've ever played Magic GPs, but it reminds me of that. And and I think it gives such a great atmosphere to places that a Pro Tour wouldn't go to and I think can grow the game itself. So, you know, two Pro Tours and a bunch of callings plus Battle Hardens is, I think, an awesome system. Yeah, yeah I mean, I that, that leads to sort of my neck. Oh, go ahead, Brody. Oh, no, you're good. I was just going to say I agree. And I think it does make sense why they wanted to do one Pro Tour this year. Um, and just ditto that I love traveling around for callings and seeing different local things. well i okay well i have to i have to i have to tag on to the end of that because you said this year so do you have a, a sort of reasonable expectation that next year we'll go back to two pro tours is this for me um or for brody i mean that was for, that was for brody because he he said this year i guess you guys both said it so yeah, we did. Uh, i'll, I'll, you I'll go, toss brody. the question over to both of you uh, I don't know what everything looks like from LSS side, so I'm just going to trust that they will make whatever decision makes the most sense. Um, I don't know if I should expect that we'll go back to two next year, but I personally hope that we are able to go back to two next year. Ada. Same, same. Okay. <laughs> I could see, yeah. I could see just sticking to one next year. It really is. It's a, it's, it's a resource thing. It's a, it's a demand thing. It's a, you know, availability thing. There's so many r things that go into it from an input standpoint. I wouldn't be, you know, I think as long as they do the right thing by the communities, continue to grow communities, continue to put callings and battle hardens out there. I think, um, you know, events, just have events. That's the main thing. Mm. Well, I mean, this uh, this question is is pretty relevant off the back of that. Is what do you think the 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 future of competitive flesh and blood is? Are we doubling down on the the calling and the battle hardened scene? Is it adequate where it's at? Like, how do you see the sort of future and expansion of competitive fab? Um, I would love to see even more callings and battle hardens, <laughs> but I mean, I think, yeah, I think that continuing to have callings and battle hardens all over the world. Um, this year we've seen more battle hardens outside of just the U.S., so even more of that would be good. I also like that we've been seeing, um, at least in the States, the Realm Games and Arcane Games and events, like kind of competitive circuits outside of just what LSS is doing. I think that that's good for the game. There's like more local ways to compete and like feel like it's this ongoing process where you're working toward um, kind of, you could say like a mini nationals or a mini world mm -hmm. at the end of the year where you're qualifying for this player's championship and i think it's really cool that lss has been supporting those circuits with like you know giving them battle hardens and pti events and things um so i'd like to see more of that like independent o op as well as plenty more battle hardens and callings and plus mm. do you think that the onus is on legend story studios to expand um the current competitive model of flesh and blood or does it lie within those grassroots organizations that are creating their own tournaments and their own circuits and it is merely lss's position to support them in the most effective way possible uh i think it's both but more realistically the latter i think that like the community is growing and like this year we've seen those two are the biggest ones who have their own competitive circuits going. And I think it'd be really cool to see more of those like all around the globe. Um, and I think just as long as, yeah, LSS is like giving them PTIs for people to fight for and like these events that they can just pass along to the local tournament organizers to give more incentives for players to play, then I think, yeah, it's like uh, more of the latter for what you said. Mm-hmm. With Dust Till Dawn on the horizon here, um, you know, our spoilers, Hayden and I spoilers, they won't be out by the time this video launches, they will but out very, very, <laughs> out very, very soon. What are you expecting to see from the set? What are you hoping to see? Um, would you potentially want to see a callback to sort of like the monarch level power of heroes and some of these heroes that have rotated out that were doing unique things in the game, things like Chain, Prism, um, you know, even Old Him to an extent? Or do you want to see something that sort of, you know, heroes and a power level that sort of I guess meshes well with what exists now, like maybe the power level of Lexi and some other heroes. Are you looking for a shakeup? Are you looking for extreme design? What are you hoping and expecting from something like Dust Till Dawn and some of the sets that follow soon after? I would love to see the new heroes be really strong and relevant in the meta, 
but maybe not so dominant as like, you know, when Starville came out, for example, like somewhere in the middle, mm -hmm. um, like you said, like if they're comparable with the current top heroes like Lexi and Dromai and everything, and they just are solidly around A tier, that would probably make me the happiest. Um, I'm really excited for new Shadow Runeblade cards, and mm. I, I'm kind of a Runeblade guy in general, so mostly excited for both set. Uh, also hyped for just like all of the non-hero cards that are coming to existing classes. Starstruck looks really cool. I'm kind of curious to see like how impactful that is, and if that card alone is going to like push Bravo up uh, significantly in the meta. Mm. Yeah, what do you think about... Uh unrelated to sort of competitive viability and impact on the meta what do you think about just fundamental design would you like to see a callback to anything like like a prism um you know with the the way prism interacted with permanence on the board and sort of how it was able to lock out another hero i don't think any other hero really does that quite as well you know obviously it's i would say it's close to ubiquitously hated but there are some prison players that love that and would, would like to see that experience again and what about chain and, and chain as well chain you know kind of drawing the entire deck i mean these are things we just these are ways of playing flesh and blood that we we don't experience anymore like what what do you want to see do you want to see heroes that you know from a design perspective are sort of more in line with what we see out of most most of the flesh and blood heroes that are legal in classic construction play right now, or would you like to see something more outside the box, like a chain or like a prism? And we can assume for argument's sake that it is balanced. Uh, I think something a little outside the box and unique would be really cool. I think my ideal dusk till dawn would be new heroes that use all of the old cards, or at least a lot of the old cards, um, you know, and like, incorporate those into their strategies but are mechanically different like i think that chain making a soul shackle every turn and kind of perpetually increasing his intellect um i would like to see vincent do something entirely different from that which it looks like uh that is the case mm. and then like prism maybe not using spectra quite as much and it's like more angel focused but some of these old yellow auras and blue auras still find their way into the deck um i think that would be like somewhere in the middle would be ideal for me yeah looks like uh i do i do think we'll be moving away from spectra that's going to be like <laughs> like the forgotten the forgotten little brother of flesh and blood at some point uh what do you have you had a chance to get your hands on any monarch drafts or have you just been hard focused on class constructed i really want to do more monarch drafting but i've only done one or two online that's one of my biggest priorities right now um leading up to nats and especially since there's only like one more week before most of the Dusk Till Dawn spoilers are out. I'd really like to jam Monarch drafts. Mm. Uh, but yeah, no, re recently I haven't been. <sighs> Sorry, this is kind of like, I'm going to be kind of tangenting away from my original point there and original question. But as you head into the, uh, as you head into Nationals, how do you, how do you sort of split your time for a multi format tournament? Like, how much do you focus on limited and how much do you focus on class construction? And what is sort of what that process look like? I think this is a good question. And it's something that I'm still trying to figure out. Mm. Um, I think that limited is less cut and dry than classic constructed in the sense that like you can continue to put more time into limited and the more time you put in, the more you'll get out, but you don't have like one deck that you have to decide on and then like clear matchups and game plans for that one deck. So I feel like there's like more of a specific to-do list for CC and limited is just like as much time as I have, I'd like to put in and keep getting better at it. So usually I kind of start with both. I do several drafts just to like understand most of the card pool and let ideas kind of start floating around in my brain. Then I focus on CC basically until it's done, done in quotes, meaning mm -hmm. I have locked in my hero. I'm mostly locked in on my deck list and I understand most matchups well. And then in the last like one week, I flush out any last confusing matchups for the CC deck and then jump back into draft as much as possible with any remaining time I have. Aiden, what about yourself? That one. That's how I like to do it as well. <laughs> I think now is a great time to be... I did... Um, I mean, I would have talked about it in the, the, the pre-show, I guess, before the main topic with Brody, but uh, I did three drafts on Sunday, a bit of a mini draft camp for Monarch Draft. Um, now, I think, is perfect opportunity before we get Dust of Dawn spoilers. And then, you know, 
I think my head starts to turn towards Class Constructed. I, I know Brody's trying to go to Birmingham. That's a lot sooner. So I have more time before I need to play Class Constructed than someone like Brody potentially does. I have to wait. You know, I'm waiting till nationals basically. Um, so I have a bit more time. So, I, But I, I do I do like splitting my time and doing it similar to, to how Brody was talking about it for sure. I, I do think, I do kind of disagree a little bit on there not being a list. I think one of the things that I love to prioritize when it comes to limited is building out a list of things I want to solve about the limited format, particularly like sort of class by class questions I want to answer about the limited format and I usually have like a pretty extensive list which is sometimes often bigger than, than class constructed I think and, and um, you know I played a lot of games outside of just drafts with with draft decks mm. um, to try and solve those questions if you could assign a percent to how much time you put into limited versus class constructed for a dual format tournament like the national championships would it be 50 50 or would it be a different split I think for me at least for Pro Tour Baltimore, which is the most recent one, and probably the one I've tested for the most extensively, it was 65% CC, 35% uh, Outsiders Draft, approximately. Good. I think it depends on the, the value of the format. So where it's 50-50, like Nationals is going to be, I'll probably split my time around 60-40. The class Constructed is always going to be a bit more, especially when it's a new format, because you need to, there's so many there's so many questions to answer about a new format. Um, whether When it's an existing format, you know, that that's a bit different. I would probably split the time into the format that is newer. So if the limited format is newer. When, for instance, um, we had Worlds, I spent a lot less time on draft because we'd done a lot of uprising draft at that point. So I probably spent maybe 20% of my time. Uh, so it, it really is dependent, I think, on the value of, of, the time you're going to put in what do you all think is the litmus test of the new class constructed format is it a deck that is able to beat lexi does lexi sort of control or does it is is lexi controlling the format right now is the first question that needs to be answered when looking at a new hero um or maybe an existing hero with new cards is like does that deck just need to beat lexi i think lexi is a really good go-to um, I forget what the term is that people use, but basically like when you're first going to try out a deck, play three games against Lexi and you have to at least win one of them for like to consider the deck or whatever. Um, this is like kind of a joke, but like legitimately that's something that uh, we've done on the team before when like coming up with a new idea is like play it against the best, fastest linear deck and it has to be able to compete there to be considered. Mm -hmm. Hayden? Yeah, it's like the benchmark Same. test, right? And I, I think yeah. I actually think it is Lexi, but I think Azuri as well. Uh, just given the the previous format, I would take usually I would take the best deck that survives the format, and then the best deck's worst matchup, and those would be the two decks that I would consider as like the benchmark kind of decks for for the next format. Mm. It's kind of hard to define Oldham's role succinctly in the last format, but if there was a deck that would it sort of take Oldham's place, what hero do you think it is? Oldham's such a unique hero and has played, oh, I, it's played like such a cool role in Flesh and Blood. Like for me, every time I build a new deck, one of the first things I have to think about is how do I have to play differently into Oldham? Um, like for more than a year now. Uh, I don't know what hero is going to replace it. Maybe Dust Till Dawn will answer that question. Bravo is the kind of obvious go to just because he's the only remaining guardian, but he plays pretty significantly differently, I would say. Mm hmm. Hayden, do you yeah, think the same I, thing or do you think it's potentially Azuri? I think it's partly Azuri, it's partly Bravo, I even think it's partly Briar, to be honest. Like, it is, it's it's all these, you know, no one hero will replace, I think, what uh, what Ultim did in this format, to Brody's point. Like, it is so unique. Ultim had access to some of the most tools, you know, it could play in so many different ways. So it's um, it, it held such a unique spot in the format. Even the ultimate decks we saw format to format, even within season change. So uh, yeah, I don't I don't think anything one thing's going to particularly replace it. But I think when it comes to linear aggro decks, which I think is the first thing people will think about when it comes to ultimate, is how ultimate interacted with those, and that is probably Azuri to an extent. Mm. Do you think some decks that were bullied out of the format by old him, by by maybe the threat of fatigue, are able to come back into the format aggro decks that can compete with something like Lexi? Mm, I definitely think that some heroes will have a better chance now. Like I believe Dorinthia always had kind of a hard time into Oldham, so that's one bad matchup gone for her. Uzuri and Dromai both struggle into Oldham, so like they that's one thing that was kind of holding them back i think especially uzuri um she can be quite powerful into a lot of aggro decks 
but has a bad olden match. Uh, Azalea is similar depending on the build. Um, Azalea consistently would just get fatigued by Oldham, especially with the original Death Dealer builds. Mm -hmm. So I think there are a lot of heroes that um, have one less bad match that they have to worry about. Yeah. Yeah. Which completely might be enough. Like, Mm -hmm. yeah, I think, you know, look at three of the the top decks in the past format, Dromai, Azuri, and Lexi. They all just lost their worst matchup in my eyes. So, (laughs) Mm -hmm. yep. At least it's how I see Uh, it. That makes sense. I, I want to talk a little bit about some mentality stuff. So obviously you've been suffering from a lot of success recently, Brody, but how do you deal with failure and how do you deal with, I guess sometimes success leads into expectation, right? You've done so well at so many battle hardens uh, consistently that, you know, do you go into these tournaments sort of expecting you're going to win? And when you maybe don't get that result, but still get what a lot of people quant- would qualify as a good result. Do you think that affects you negatively? Does it hurt your mentality? Like, do you build up this sort of, this 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 equity in, in ego and sort of consistently doing well at these tournaments. How do you how do you sort of maintain your humility and you know get past what could be potentially failure at future tournaments? Just like talk a little bit about your mentality, how you keep your head your, your level head as a pro player. So I definitely don't go in expecting to win. I think that uh, I think that confidence is important, but I don't think that going into a tournament expecting to win it or get um, get a result that, you know, ultimately is going to require some luck or something's going your way is very healthy. I think I do set goals for myself for like what I would like to get out of a a weekend or maybe a season, but I try not to let bad performances or losses shake my mental, um, especially within one tournament. Like I think I've had situations, especially last year where I would like make a really silly punt and lose a game to it. And then, that would affect my play later in the day. And then maybe it's like a situation where I still had the ability to top eight, but I didn't because I lost a second game because I was worried about the first game um, and still focused on it. So I think basically being able to process the loss uh, is important. Deal with your emotions, whether it's in the middle of a tournament or after, especially after, like take some time to reflect on it, especially if it was because you made mistakes, what can you learn from it? But I think once you've learned everything you can from it, you have to just let it go if you want to continue succeeding and you know get ready for the next tournament. My rule for myself is usually I process it until the end of the day. And then as long as I've taken every takeaway I can from it, the next morning I'm on to the next thing. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, reframing losses and failures uh, in a way that you view them as opportunities to learn is a great heuristic for life. Um, but Brody, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on this week. It's, it's always great to hear from you and great to get, get into sort of the mind of a master. I mean, you've been on a crazy tear for a while. I remember not too long ago, uh, playing you in our local game store when your entire family was there. I think it was for a pre-release or some sort of blitz event. Um, and now you're, you're definitely in contention for one of the best players in the world and just absolutely crushing tournaments back to back to back uh, for our viewers and, and our listeners um where can they find you and sort of what are you up to these days i don't know if you have twitter and anything you want to plug uh yeah you can find me at brody spurlock on twitter that's the really the only place i am on social media right now thanks so much for having me on guys it's been great chatting awesome well thank you all so much for listening this week there is a video version of this podcast on youtube at youtube.com slash arsenal pass hayden and i are both on twitter at brennan apg and hayden is at fian underscore dale and brody just told you uh his tag of course um there is a review this week but i don't have it handy because i'm on a laptop but if you listen to this podcast and you've been listening for a while the number one thing you can do to help us is leave us a five-star review apple podcast is preferred and there's also rate this podcast.com slash arsenal pass which will aggregate all those links for you and make it super super easy special thank you to all the patreon members you're the reason we're able to do what we do and your support we are incredibly grateful Thank you all so much for listening. We'll see you next week.